Hello, it's Saturday the 28th of February. You're tuned in to our 6pm newscast coming to you from Adidang's News Centre in Seoul. It's great to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this evening, President Park Geun-hye is putting the final touches to her speech commemorating Korea's March 1st Independence Movement Day. The tension is focused on what message she will deliver to Japan as 2015 marks the 50th anniversary of the normalization of diplomatic relations between the two countries. Ties are at their lowest point in years due to Tokyo's lack of repentance for its wartime atrocities, including its sexual enslavement of Korean women. During this year's speech, the president is expected to demand Japan atone for its treatment of the now elderly victims. We'll have live coverage of the ceremony and President Park's speech from around 10 a.m. Korea time on Sunday. Now, on a related note, a Japanese scholar who is helping Prime Minister Shinzo Abe draw up a statement marking the 70th anniversary of Japan's surrender in World War II has warned that excessive demands for Tokyo to apologize for its history could hinder reconciliation with its neighbors. Diplomats from the two Koreas look set for a showdown in Geneva next week over Pyongyang's human rights and nuclear issues. South Korea will call on the United Nations to do more to tackle North Korea's human rights abuses, but the North is ready to fight its own corner. Park ji -won reports. The two Koreas are expected to clash over Pyongyang's human rights and nuclear issues at two separate meetings in Geneva next week. South Korea's Vice Foreign Minister Cho tae will deliver a keynote speech at the UN Human Rights Council on Tuesday, where he is expected to urge the UN to further pressure North Korea to sort out its dire human rights situation. This follows the UN General Assembly's adoption late last year of a resolution condemning the North's human rights abuses. On what could be a tense day in Geneva, North Korea's Foreign Minister Lee Soo-yoon is also set to deliver a speech claiming that the UN resolution, which calls for the North Korean leadership to be referred to the International Criminal Court, should be nullified. The diplomats will clash again at the upcoming conference on disarmament, also taking place in Geneva next week. The South Korean vice minister is expected to stress the need to end North Korea's nuclear programs while pledging Seoul's support to the UN's non-proliferation efforts. The North Korean official is likely to defend Pyongyang's nuclear program by saying it is vital to his country's national security. Meanwhile, North Korea is reportedly drawing up its own human rights law to protect the country's vulnerable people like the physically challenged. Radio Free Asia reports that North Korea's Vice Foreign Minister Lee Yong ho has told U.S. officials that Pyongyang wants the law to go in effect within this year. Park ji -won, Arirang News. North Korea has been told to forget ever being able to win recognition as a nuclear state. U.S. Under Secretary of State Wendy Sherman says Pyongyang is hoping to follow in the footsteps of Pakistan, a country whose nuclear program was first protested but over time became accepted. Speaking in Washington on Friday local time, the U.S. official said North Korea will never be able to obtain the security, prosperity or respect it wants without ending its nuclear and missile programs. Despite the strong words, Sherman said Washington was open to holding direct talks with North Korea, but the focus of the dialogue would have to be about the regime's denuclearization. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un says he wants his military to be ready for war with the United States as Pyongyang cranks up the rhetoric ahead of Seoul and Washington's annual joint drills that start on Monday. The regime state media reported Saturday that Kim made the rallying call after inspecting a new guard unit hall at a war museum. The report said Kim was joined by Hwang byung so director of the General Political Bureau of the North Korean Army, and Cher Yong-hae, the secretary of the Workers' Party. 
What well, just say it's interesting to note that Huang was mentioned ahead of Che in a report for the first time in almost six months. They believe it could indicate Huang has regained his position as North Korea's second most powerful man. Now, most people have experienced a ringing in their ears at one time or another, perhaps after a loud uh, music concert. It's a condition called tinnitus, and the number of people suffering from it in Korea is on the rise, unfortunately. If the ringing is temporary, it's usually not that much of an issue, but if it's constant, it can be unbearable and could signal a bigger underlying problem. Our Son Jung-in reports. A year ago, Ha Yuri started to hear a loud beeping sound in her left ear, ringing for 20 seconds and sometimes occurring as often as five to six times a day. The event coincided with a time when she was undergoing a major shift in her responsibilities at the office, which caused her a lot of stress. I hear the ringing sound as loud as the hum of a refrigerator motor, and it bothers me during the day. Tinnitus is a condition in which people hear constant or periodic sounds. It's not caused by an outside source, but a perception of sound in their head, and it can appear more frequently in people who are experiencing fatigue or stress. The number of people in Korea suffering from the condition has risen by 16 percent from five years ago. Almost everyone has had a form of soft ringing in their ears heard for a few seconds. But if the problem persists and the sound is heard constantly in only one year and affects your ability to perform the normal activities of daily life, it could indicate a more serious problem. Nearly 90 percent of people with sudden deafness found it was accompanied by ringing in their ears. Many patients will go to the hospital for the ringing and later will experience hearing loss. Because tinnitus could be a sign of a serious condition, doctors say it is important to identify the underlying cause. There is currently no cure, but one way to prevent tinnitus is to avoid loud noises, salty food, or excessive consumption of alcohol or caffeine. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Now, a leading Russian opposition politician has been shot dead in Moscow. Boris Nemtsov was gunned down while walking with a woman on a bridge near the Kremlin. A witness says a car stopped and an unidentified man got out, shooting him four times in the back. Now, Nemtsov was a prominent opposition leader in Russian politics for more than two decades, rising to deputy prime minister under Boris Yeltsin. The 55-year-old was also a fierce critic of President Putin and also Russia's involvement in Ukraine and was mounting a large opposition rally this Sunday in Moscow. President Vladimir Putin has condemned the killing and assumed personal control of the investigation, but many in Russia believe the killing may have been done by assassins close to the Russian government. Lawmakers in the United States have avoided a partial shutdown of Homeland Security after passing a one-week funding extension just hours before a midnight deadline. The House approved the extension in a vote of 357 to 60, easily more than the two-thirds majority required. This means the Department of Homeland Security's quarter of a million employees will continue to receive their paychecks while a longer-term funding agreement is discussed. Some Republicans have been pushing to use the funding of the department as a bargaining chip to force President Barack Obama to gut his divisive immigration proposals. Staying in the U.S., and eight people have been killed in a shooting spree in a small town in the U.S. state of Missouri. The gunman, identified as 36-year-old Joseph Aldridge, went door to door at several homes, shooting and killing seven relatives and neighbors, all adults, in, a, in the tiny community of Tyrone before driving off and apparently turning the gun on himself. Authorities say the motive for the killings remains unclear, but reports suggest the suspect may have been unhinged by the death of his ailing mother. Back here in Korea, and a royal kitchen behind Seoul's famous Gyeongbokgung Palace is set to be open to the public this spring. The centuries-old kitchen, used solely to prepare the king and queen's dishes, was uh, destroyed during Japan's colonial rule of Korea in the early 20th century, but now it's back open. Connie Kim has the details.
This is a scene from one of Korea's most popular dramas, Daejanggum or Jewel in the Palace, which captivated audiences with its tale of a young cook learning the intricacies of royal court cuisine. The kitchen, where the drama was said, doesn't exist anymore as it was destroyed during Japan's colonial rule of Korea in 1915. But now, a hundred years later, it is set to open to the public this spring at Gyeongbokgung Palace in Seoul. We're planning to open up the Royal Kitchen in May during the Royal Palace Cultural Festival. The kitchen will be used to exhibit reproductions of what used to be used in palaces. Researchers from the Cultural Heritage Administration began the restoration process in 2011, studying images of the original kitchen. There are three main areas for each type of food prepared, one for the king's food, another for festival food, and a third for desserts. The kitchen is just one of the more than 140 places at the historic palace that have been restored. This year, the Cultural Heritage Administration is planning to restore Hungbokjeon, a meeting place for foreign ambassadors. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Now, before we go, let's take a brief look at the weekend weather for Korea. And most of the country is under cloudy skies this evening. We're going to see the overnight low dip down to one degree Celsius in the capital and the central region could actually see some light snow in the morning. Sunday will bring conditions similar to today with the high topping out at six degrees Celsius in Seoul. Finally, the global weather conditions for our viewers around the world. That's all we have for now. Do enjoy the rest of your Saturday and stay tuned to Arirang TV. Plenty of good programming coming up. We'll be back again for our next newscast at 10 p.m. Korea time. So until then, goodbye.